So tonight we're going to hear from Heather and Robert, who own the Armory of Bookbindery in Columbus. Um, it's a traditional bookbindery that specializes in restoration and conservation, um, and they pride themselves on doing all of their work by hand. So now I'm going to turn it over to Heather and Robert. Thanks, Jamie. Um, first of all, I want to thank Jamie and the Westerville Library for inviting us to speak. We're really excited to tell you a little bit about what we do, a little bit of history on bookbinding, show you some of our work, and of course, answer any questions you might have. Um, and we welcome all of you here. We're glad you could be here. I'm going to go ahead. I have a PowerPoint presentation we prepared. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. Mm, we'll go to the presentation, share that. All right, are we good? Can you see that? Okay, perfect. Let me, there is, trying to get this off. Okay. Thank you. There was a box in the middle of our presentation. So, all right. all right. So we are Rob and Heather and our company is Armaria Bookbindery. We are in Columbus, Ohio, located. I always tell everybody Hilliard because that's the closest that we can get to that gives people a good reference point. Um, we actually work out of our home. Um, we have a basement studio and it has expanded and it's going to expand even more. We just acquired um, probably about, oh, I don't know. You'll get to see, because I have pictures of the equipment, of old bindery equipment. Um, so we're looking at commercial space right now. Um, so Rob, you wanna tell them a little bit. So one of the questions that comes up is why the word um, where, <laughs> Armaria. Yeah, where like, our name came from. Yeah, where did our name come from? So do you want to explain that? I was going to let you. Okay, so <laughs> Armaria is actually, a, as you can see in the picture, was an old cabinet that was used to house the scrolls in the um, ancient Greek and Roman times. And it was used to protect and preserve the scrolls. And we thought that it was suiting for our business because that's exactly what we do. We want to protect and preserve books. Um, and it makes for a great conversation piece too when everybody asks about it. All right, so we're going to tell you a little bit. Another question that always comes up is how did you even get into book binding? How did you come into this? So I was an art teacher for 15 years. Um, and about six or seven years ago, I started taking book binding classes to actually um, teach my students how to book bind. And I was trying to incorporate literature in the arts. And um, what happened is, and this was down in Parkersburg, West Virginia. That's where I was living at the time. Local newspaper did an article about me teaching my students, and there happened to be a retired bookbinder that lived in the area. And she reached out to me and said she had all this leftover supplies and if I wanted it. And so we kindled a friendship and she asked me, would you like to learn conservation restoration? By the way, um, a shout out to her. Her name is Julie Schleier. Um, she owned and operated the business, The Book Doctor, down in Dallas, Texas for about 30 years um, and then moved up to West Virginia and retired up here. Um, so anyhow, she asked me if I wanted to learn and I said, absolutely. And she took me in under her wing um, and she taught me everything she knew and continues to teach me. When I come across a book that I'm having, you know, you're stumped on, I give her a call and she helps me with it. Um, and then what ended up happening, COVID hit, um, school shut down. I met my husband at the time and um, 
I decided to leave teaching and venture into being an entrepreneur and go full time doing this. And it's been going great since. And I'll let him tell, I'll let my husband speak for a little bit too. <laughs> Just a little bit. So um, my background was in architectural drafting and design, but I always needed to do something with my hand. So I was in construction management but I always like to tinker, woodworking. Um, I really enjoy restoring antique motorcycles. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to finish up a 1930s Indian right now. <laughs> you can't finish it right now because no. <laughs> we're filling the garage with book bindery equipment. <laughs> yes. So unfortunately his projects have been, like I said, we need a larger space. Yeah. So Things are getting put on hold, but it's for a good reason. So um, like Heather said, we met, she introduced me into her world of book finding and I just fell in love. It's, it's very, um, I still get to do stuff with my hands. Um, it's restoring something that's falling apart, just part of history, just things that we just both are very passionate about. And she's teaching me everything that she knows. And I am still very novice at it. He handled, you know, I have to give him kudos though. He, I mean, he's a huge part of this business. And when he has the opportunity, he sits down and he helps me and he's learning and he's doing a great job. So, all right, I am going to go to the next slide. So the question is, what is restoration, conservation, and repair? What is it that we're doing? So um, conservation. Conservation is where we get an old book and we need to stabilize the condition of it. Um, a lot of times you have mold issues, you have issues with bugs, um, of course, the book is starting to deteriorate, and what we need to do is prevent it from further deterioration. Um, and an example is when we get family Bibles, which is our number one thing that we get, a lot of times when you have leather covers, it is essential that they get conditioned on a yearly basis, that they get a special oil treatment. Um, and most of the Bibles, what ends up happening is it gets placed in the back of a closet or worse yet in a basement or in an attic where you're gonna be suffering all these temperature changes, humidity, things like this. And so we get these Bibles where the leather is completely dried out. And so we have to do, I use a material called Clusel G. You cannot reverse leather rot. Once leather dries and rots, you can't turn it back to leather again. And so we don't want it to continue to break apart brittle. Um, so by placing this, um, it, it's with a rubbing alcohol solution. It sounds like counterintuitive, but it works because it evaporates quickly and it soaks with the adhesive and then binds that dry leather together. So that is a approach when it comes to conservation. Restoration is about the structure of the book. We're trying to strengthen something so that it can be used again. We're making it so, we're not making it look brand new, like it came off the shelf in 1920. We don't want it look like it was just produced then. We still want to maintain its antique look. You would devalue a book if I went back and tried to make it all new and pretty. Um, our goal is to go into the book, look at the time period it was made, um, look at the sewing, look at the materials, and we repeat that same process if we feel it is um, going to help the book. Is, if we find that some of the techniques that they use, like I said, um, we have issues with leather. The leather that they use on family Bibles were highly tanned and processed. Um, we don't use that type of leather. We actually use a goatskin leather because it's the most durable type of leather and it's a book binding leather that we use and we match it to the book. So there's like little changes and stuff like that that we do. 
Um, and then I have to throw in repair, fix, or mend because like we do get a lot of personal Bibles where we end up taking off the old cover and putting a new cover on it. And that doesn't necessarily fall under conservation restoration um, because we're essentially putting something new on it. I'm not gonna read through this whole list, but this is a lot of what we do. Um, we do, our number one thing that we get and ask for is family Bibles and personal Bibles. Then you come across cookbooks, children's books, and then antique books. And then we get some where people want custom orders where we hand bind a book for them. Like whether it's an author who wants their own book made. Um, so, you, you know, the other thing that, yeah, and we offer workshops, which I'll get into that later as well. Um, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. That's I okay. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my train of thought. I was saying, oh, um, most of the books that we can get in are not of monetary value. They're more of sentimental value. We do on the occasion do get antique books that I think the most expensive book I have worked on was $15,000. So we get an occasional book that's worth several thousands of dollars that we work on, but we treat all our books the same. They're all priceless, right? Something of sentimental value to me is priceless. So we're gonna take care of that like that's our baby and make sure that we get it back to them in the best shape that we can and better. So this is some examples of our work, of what we do. Um, so the one on the left is actually a slip case with a wrap. Um, and it was, this was a book of actually high value where we didn't wanna go in. And people ask us, if you do restoration conservation, will you devalue the book? And the answer is yes and no. It depends on the buyer. Um, I've, some buyers want it just the way it is, cover off, rips and all. They don't want somebody going in and messing with it. While there's some other people who will pay to have a nice antique replicated um, new cover on it. So it really depends on the buyer. So in this case, we decided we didn't want to get into the book and mess with it because of its um, costs. And he wanted something that would protect it. And this gives it a protective shell, but yet gives it the look of a book that can go on. You can kind of see how it works where, oh, I wish I had a planer. I don't have one on this. Okay. But you can see how it slides out and then opens up. So the image on the right is a cloth covered family Bible. And our nightmare is when people decide to take their books. Worst thing you can do to a book. Um, you know, you think it's a temporary fix, but what ends up, and aside from this cover, but what happens is one, Tape is highly acidic, so it does severe damage to the paper. But when you tape a page, all of a sudden you're adding bulk to that page and you're also adding bulk to the pages around it. And what we find is when somebody temporarily puts tape in, in one part, you have all the pages in front and back ripping out with it. So big no-no is putting tape ever, any type of tape on a book. I can tell you tape that can be used, um, but I also think it needs to be handled with by a professional. Well, we also get um, in the family Bibles, flowers, newspaper articles. Um, hair clippings. Hair clippings, obituary cards, and everything that they put in just keeps on adding bulk. And more and more and more and that's so that adds yeah that stresses the spine and sewing and you would think something so subtle and small wouldn't the other thing you have to worry about is that if you start inserting stuff into the book it transfers the image um press flowers is by far the worst that attracts bugs um and that too 
you got those organic, it's decomposing now in the book, right? So not only are you attracting bugs, but now you have bacteria, mold damage that's happening to the page as well. Um, so yeah, so this is just a couple of examples. These are some other examples that we've done. The one on the left-hand side, this is a direct, a Parkersburg directory. I think it was from 1910, right around that time period. And their dog got a hold of it and chewed the entire book up. This was a challenging <laughs> project to say the least, because I mean, it was literally like a puzzle where I had to take page by page, bit by bit, and slowly piece it back together. This was a clay coated paper. Um, so I couldn't use um, liquid wet glue on it. I had to do a heat set tissue on it. Um, yeah, because clay coated paper, once you get it wet, it stains. So I was careful about that. Bible on the top left. Um, this is, I'm sorry, top right is um, where we put a new cover on. But a lot of people think that red cover there, it's called bonded leather. Bonded leather is not real leather. It looks like it, it's stamped to look like it. And you may be lucky if they do throw some scrap leather in there, but oftentimes it's like a paper pulp stamp to look like leather. And if they're extra generous, they throw some leather shavings in it, you know, into the pulp mix. It doesn't last, it's acidic as well. Um, I call it the hot dog leather. I, I never, and people have asked if I would use it and it's just not the type of work I put out there. So I don't use it because I know it doesn't last. Um, bottom right corner, that's a wedding album. I'm sorry, to, that was pulling apart. It was new, probably five years old. Pages way too heavy. Bus the um, photo album company actually went out of business because I researched it, but I had to build it back up. And to be honest with you guys, I could call it the wedding album. Um, for <laughs> it was a nightmare. It was really difficult to work with, but I don't need to go into the logistics of it. But there was things that just made it very difficult to repair. Um, here's another family um, Bible. This is probably one of my favorites. Um, grandma decided to laminate the family Bible. Um, a, another, you know, thinking that she was protecting and preserving it. So, uh, a lot of people put books in bags. It's actually, what happens is if you put your book in a Ziploc bag, or in this case, decide to laminate an entire book, you are creating a greenhouse. So, if you put a book in the bag, it's going to trap mold, it's going to exasperate it, and it's also going to, all the humidity, all the stuff that's already in that book, it, it's just going to grow. It's like a greenhouse for it. Um, and here's a tip for you. If you have a book that you feel has mold, or you had some flowers in it, or that you think has bug damage, you can put it in the freezer. And in this case, definitely bag it because you don't want to get food on it. <clears throat> Put it in the freezer for between 24 to 48 hours. You do need to let it thaw because the glue on that spine is frozen. And then, um, excuse me, <coughs> is frozen. And after you let it thaw out for about 24 to 48 hours, it should... Um, stop any damage that was going on in the book. All right. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of books. Some of this you may know, some of it you may not. <coughs> Please forgive me, I have a cold. So hopefully this won't be going on throughout the, the whole presentation. So the purpose of a book, think about it, you know, how we recorded. I love, cause this is the art teacher and me loving to teach my students. You know, you gotta go back to early forms of writing, cave time where they're writing on the walls and recording stuff in that manner. So you needed to eventually need something 
to record information, but also for it to be easily portable. And, you know, so that was where the invention of the scroll. I'm sticking to the Western timeline because we can get into the ideas of the Mayans and the stone tablets and all that, but I'm gonna kind of stick with this for now. So you have the scroll, but that was very unraveling it and putting it back together. They found it very um, difficult to work with. And so the next thing that came around, what would be considered the codex is they started to take wood boards and sew them on the edge together. And believe it or not, in the um, bookbinding world, codex is a very controversial topic <laughs> because some people do not feel that the wooden tablets being sewn is technically a codex, that it had to be made of vellum or paper. Um, folded sheets sewn on the side. So if you go and research that, you'll see some different definitions. Um, so it's about the second or fourth century that books are actually starting to be made. They're using vellum, um, but books are rare because vellum was hard to come by as long as well as parchment, but that's what they were using for um, for pages and it's primarily Christianity and for the church. Um, there was nothing decorative about it. What they would do is either put two boards be to protect it or do a leather wrap around it. Um, jump ahead to about 12th century and then what happens is you start to get even more mass production and so you get these scriptoriums where the monks are working on and making um, Bibles and actually the family and Bible is inspired by the Gothic age of design because they were highly ornate, lots of gold, jewels, metalwork, um, and it was created again, it was for the church, but it was also for the wealthy. Around this time period, um, the West Europe discovers rag paper. And rag paper has been around in Asia for quite some time, but didn't become popular until about the 12th century. And so it replaces vellum and parchment, so it's cheaper to use. And also this is about the time period that universities are starting to pop up and become popular and people are becoming educated. So the demand for books is, um, growing. And so when the demand for something increases, you know, people want to improve on structure, technique, and materials. And so that's how the growth of the book is happening. Um, this is an interesting fact because the books were so big, they weren't um, set on its, uh, what you would call the tail of the book. They were actually laid flat. And the fore edge of the book, which is the side where the text is facing out, the spine would face inside the bookshelf and the fore edge would face out and they would actually title on the fore edge, not the spine of the book. That would happen later on. So about the Renaissance period, you have Gutenberg, he invents the printing press and now you have even more books that are able to be accessible. So you're increasing the production time and getting things more out there. And so publishing houses are starting to pop up as well. Um, this is where I like to, I get more interested in the books because we start, what we work with primarily are 18th, 19th, 20th century books. And a lot of people think if they bring a book to us that was old, it's from the 1800s, therefore it has to be worth a lot of money. And actually that's not necessarily true. Um, and they also think like, wow, these books had to be made, you know, so they had to be hand bound. Well, you're looking at the turn of the 18th century to the 19th century, you got the industrial revolution that's starting to take place. And so machines are starting to replace hand binding and you get mass production is starting to happen. And so books are being made much faster and much cheaper. So, I mean, although I do say this, the books were definitely made better than they are today. They are definitely made better, but they're not as good as earlier books. So 
I talk about, so the impact of the industrial revolution on the book there, here's even an example. Do you see the half, how it's half leather, half paper and the corners are done? That was a shortcut method. That actually was a um, time saving and cost saving method. It, it wasn't just for decoration instead of covering an entire book in leather. This helped save money. Um, I think I covered most of this. Oh, one thing that also happened that was a detriment to books is that rag paper is actually being replaced with tree pulp paper and tree pulp paper was, it's very acidic. And you'll see that in books where the paper is very brittle and dry and discolored. Um, also from this time period, the leather was processed much faster. And again, they don't understand the idea of books being highly acidic and, you know, for in the next hundred years that this would have deteriorating effects on the book. All right, so for today's books, um, so we get a lot of books from, you know, the last 20 or 30 years because they too are mass produced, but now they don't even sew the books. We, it's called perfect abound. It's kind of like a, it's what you typically do for a paperback book, but basically they rough, rough up the edge of the spine and sometimes they don't even do that and they put a layer of glue on it and that's it. So we get a lot of Bibles that are like that and they pull apart like post-it notes. It's just not a, it's not a, it's not a good way of uh, making a book. The other one is Smysone, that's machine sewn and Smysone's okay, but what I find Smysone actually does separate stitching going down machine sewn. But when I clean off a spine and it's Smysone, once one thread, it's like it's looped onto the bottom thread. So if you pull a thread, they all come unraveled. So it's, it is strong, but not unless if the thread gets broke, it's done. And of course, I, you have to add ebooks and technology, right? I mean, that's, that would be a topic of discussion all in itself is like are is technology replacing the book and libraries of today and i would like to think not i mean our business is doing really well people feel pretty sentimental to books and i don't know about you but i like a book in my hand i, I there's just something different for me having a book and turning the page um first looking at a screen that but I understand the convenience of technology too. It's easy to transport and have multiple books on one iPad versus carrying, you know, 10 books around. All right. So the books that you're looking at, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more history about books. When books were originally made and the leather was, this is called a tight back book where you actually create the case, the cover, and the leather and the spine on the book itself. It gets glued directly to the spine, which is why it's called a tight back. So this was a common method. Then it gets, oops. Um, this is a more efficient method. Um, but I, I prefer doing the, um, tight back, but I do it with a technique called hollow back and we won't go into the technicals <laughs> of that either, but I like building on the text block myself. Um, I find case binding, it can be helpful in some areas, but I find it to be inferior to actually building up on the book itself. Uh, but a case binding is also something that came out of the industrial revolution. You had one machine sewing the book while another one is making the cover and case. And then you have it separate and it comes together. I include it on here. So when I start using all these fancy words, which are, you know, it's to me, I don't realize I'm sometimes saying it, but you can see here a book is um, you have the end sheets. 
you have um, the top of the book is called the head. You have the bottom book, it's called the tail. The papers that connect the book to the case are called end sheets. Um, yeah, the, you have the spine and then you have the fore edge of the book. So the most common um, restoration that we perform on books, it's called a reback restoration. It's where the book comes unhinged or rips at the seam or hinge of the cover and needs to be replaced. So we wanna keep the original cover, but we need to put something in there to strengthen it. And if you look at the Treasure Island book, you can kind of see, I, what I've done is I've taken a uh, new book cloth material and I'm tucking it under the cover of the book. So I'm creating a new spine piece, putting it in there. And then I'm actually going, and you don't see it on there, but I take the original spine piece that was on it and I'll glue it on there as well. You see the difference in color? Um, thankfully, being an art teacher for 15 years, you know, a little what you do, a little watercolor, watercolor pencils, color pencils, you touch it up and you can just blend it in. And I, I don't make it look new. I just make it blend right in. So this would be an example of a book that would need um, a reback, also restoration, but you have pages coming out. But these are some of um, I, I get this a lot. Um, and a person sent me these photos and she said to me, um, can you fix this? And I said, absolutely. But she goes, well, I just need the pages glued back in. And I said, well, unfortunately it's not that simple. She's like, yeah, yeah. You just glue it right back, <laughs> glue it right back in, just kind of tuck it in there. And I said, well, it doesn't, work like that. It's kind of like what I told you about the tape. If I go in and glue those pages on top of the other pages, it'll pull on those other pages and then that will just pop out. I literally have to go in and remove all the old glue off the back of the spine. And then because I could tell this book was not sewn, if you see that jagged edge, it, that's how they roughed up the edge and this was perfect bound. So I got to get that old plastic glue off. I'm going to actually strengthen and do a cord sawed into the side that'll hold it and I fan glue it. Then, I mean, that is what's going to hold it back together. I don't recommend to anyone, any people think, oh, I could just put some Elmer's glue down inside of it and tip it right back in it'll just pop right back out and it'll take all the pages with it that are in front and back. So I have a book here uh, showing that it's deconstructed. If you look, oh good, there is a mouse. Can you see my mouse moving? Oh good, I have a pointer. So you can see here, we actually already, so we took all the old adhesive off the spine and we put new liner on it. I like to use an Irish linen. I find it to be the strongest. You have what you call mole or super. Um, I found over time that that tends to become brittle and dry. I find linen is the strongest and holds up the best. It's expensive, but it works. And actually the, this is the final product. Um, the front book on, oops, go back to, so now my mouse is not showing again. That's okay. So the picture to the right, the book in the front, that is actually where I painted a Mariki paper with Irish linen to give it a faux leather look. Um, the person didn't want to pay for actual leather, and so I recreated it. So comparing to the one in the back, that is actual leather to the one in the front. 
So, and you can see the finished product here of the series of books. Another thing that we do, you can see the black mold on here that was growing. This was a cookbook. And I'm sure that's just from all the food and recipes. So I went in and did some cleaning on that. Um, I used wheat paste a little bit. It's very, um, uh, what I wanna say, harmless. It, you would think being that it's a um, adhesive, it's a very mild, mild adhesive. And what it does is it softens the dirt on the surface and doesn't compromise the color. I don't let it sit too long. I just put it on a Q-tip and just kind of wipe on it. Oh, and here's another tip for you. If you have a page in a book that is like folded or bent and you wanna put it back, if you just take a, a very lightly damp Q-tip, go over the crease, and then on a low setting, take an iron and iron over it. Um, it won't be perfect. The crease will be there, but it'll set it back in place for you. And what we used to protect the page of the book is parchment paper, not wax paper, parchment. Do not use wax. Wax will transfer to the page. Um, we talked already quite a bit about family Bibles. So family Bibles were very popular in the 19th century. Um, they were a place for people to keep records, personal records. It's where you would record your marriages. It's where you record the deaths. Um, everybody had one. Um, but these two were mass produced. They're absolutely gorgeous. They were inspired by the Gothic period, highly ornate but the leather was tanned very harshly. And so they're sometimes very difficult to work with. Um, if you have a family Bible, my recommendation is one, it needs to be in an acid-free box. I recommend wrapping it in organic um, cotton or uh, in a linen cloth, wrapping it and putting it in the acid-free box. And it should not be in a place where there's severe temperature change, such as the basement or attic. And there should be in a place where there's not high humidity. Another thing people think about family Bibles, they think that they, because of how big and beautiful they are, that they're worth a lot of money. Um, a family Bible, unless it's a very rare, rare Bible or owned by somebody famous, they can go anywhere between $50 to maybe about $200 to $300. Um, I think because it belongs to a particular family, they don't have that sentimental value. Um, so they're not, and they were, they were mass produced. It seems like everybody I know's family has one. Um, this is an example of, I think this is a Bible from the 1950s, 1960s. This is also that stamped leather. Um, and it is really difficult to work with. Like I can't salvage and it has that flap around it that hangs off of it. And what we do is a sudden frame with new leather. So just showing another example of what we do with Bibles. Here's some of our, um, so this is stuff that we just recently purchased. There's a bindery that went out of business. We do have already both of, we have um, already presses and we already have what you call a job backer, but the photo, do you want to talk about this? Sure, this I'll is take a turn. Your turn. <laughs> so the picture on the left is a what's called a job backer. And that is what we use to create the shoulders of the book, as well as on rounded books, you can create the rounding of the spine. And the pictures on the right, those are uh, book presses, which we use a lot when you lose something, you want to press it. Um, a lot of our downtime is just waiting for glue to dry. It's like watching paint dry. 
next screen. Um, the picture on the left is a standing press. Um, when they mass produce books, you know, you'll have 10, 15 books. These presses are tall enough to where you can literally just do layers of books and then press them all at one time. The picture on the right is a guillotine, which will cut usually about a four inch stack of paper. Um, we also just acquired a, a job backer that has a pivoting roller on it that helps create the rounded spine as well. I'm excited for that one. Yeah, to try that out. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> I, I still like using that you use a, when you do rounding and backing, you do a, a hammering technique and I feel more comfortable. That might be too advanced in technology, be, the, yeah. the roller going back and forth yeah. and allowing a machine to do it. It doesn't take electricity though, so it's okay. Yeah, so. <laughs> The only piece of equipment that we do have that does take electricity is the hot foil stamper. Yeah. So, all right. So I have up here um, just some ideas of protecting and preserving your book and things that I've already suggested to you is, um, and I have some links to some web pages as well if you want to go and where to find this stuff, but acid-free box to protect a book. You know, we do family Bibles and they want to set them on display. I said, get it out when you have company and then put it away. It, you don't want it sitting out in the light. You don't want it exposed to the elements and the pollutants in the air. It needs to be safe and secure. You just invested in having it restored. You know, you don't want to further damage it. So I talked about stable temperature out of light. Um, if you have leather, it needs to be conditioned and it's important the type of leather conditioner that you use. I use a particular brand called Marnie's. I get it from actually overseas. It's a UK product. Um, there's a place called Talus Online. I have a link to it that you may be able to find some stuff, but I personally would not use anything that is upholstery. Um, somebody was asking me, they do conditioning of their leather saddles, and I researched the ingredients in it to see if that could be used on the book, and we found out that it had some um, acidic ingredients, so I said that's a no-go. Um, so the other thing is um, large books should lay flat. You don't want them setting up when you have a huge text block. It'll pull on the um, hinges of the spine, the weight of the book. So they should lay flat. And when you have books on a bookshelf, it's not proper for them to lean or be off to the side. You want them nice and snug and pressed into the bookshelf. Do you have anything else that you can think of to add to that list? Mm -hmm. I think that covers some of it. All right. So we do host um, classes. So if that's something you're interested in, I'll show you because we have some coming up. Um, so we're going to have a basic, the reback restoration that I was telling you about. Um, we're going to be teaching a, a two day workshop on that. Um, this is like sewing and casing your own hardback book. This one is a Japanese stab binding book. And I believe this is the toolkits. And I recommend our toolkits. I had a person that came with our class with all like their alternative tools and just ended up borrowing mine. If you end up being serious about this, the stuff that we suggest to use, it's quality material. And you need that if you're gonna be working on antique books and want to make sure you're doing a, a decent job. So um, all right. I think that comes to the end of our presentation. So we can open it up for questions and answers. And I do see there is something in the chat. 
Yeah, we've got a question. Um, are library editions made with wrap paper still? Are library editions still made with rag paper? Like, I'm not sure what a library edition, what they mean by that. And you're welcome. If, if you want to unmute yourself and chat or clarify, um, definitely feel free to. I, I asked the question about library editions. I was making an assumption that perhaps the edition of a book that a library buys might be more durable in some way than the one sold to the popular public. Uh, that's not necessarily true. No, they use paper pulp. Um, it's very uncommon these days that um, books are made with rag paper, unless it's like a professional and some, you know, a book binder that understands the importance of not using um, tree pulp paper. Um, the other thing about library books is they use um, a buckram book cloth, which is very durable in sense of like not being able to be stained and it just handles a little bit well, but I find it to also be very stiff. And so around the edges of the book, you'll start to see in the corners and the um, corner edges start to wear quickly. The best material for a book is goat skin. That is the most durable. Did that help answer your question? Yes. Yeah, I I, one more question um, sure. about the classes that you offer. Um, how would a person be able to apply the knowledge after the class? Because the average person wouldn't have all the book binding presses and other things. Um, that you have so sure there's definitely remember i had to start somewhere as well and um for example like if you don't have a press you just my husband just brought down from the garage um what are you called the weights oh yeah the circle weights that you would use for arm lifting with a piece of wood board, I put the book between two wood boards and stack the weight on that. And that can kind of act as a press. Um, it just depends on the equipment. You can make it work. And there, there is antique equipment out there. Um, when we get to the next slide, I, can sh I have a website <clears throat> listed that offers and sells bookbinding equipment that I, that I feel is reputable. We've got another question in the chat um, around how much does it cost to have a book restored and conserved, or is that on a book by book basis? <laughs> so that is definitely on a book by book basis. Uh, so just to give you some numbers to throw out there, our minimum starting price is 140. Um, we kind of charge by the hour and then cost of materials. Our cost by the hour is $35 an hour, um, which we feel is really reasonable. If you think about like contractors and um, people who are specialized mechanics, what they make every hour. So 35 an hour for something of a rare trade, but we also have to think about your average person and what they're willing to pay. So we're, we do 35 an hour for like page repair, sewing a book, and then it just depends on the, the condition of the book, how long we feel we're gonna be working on it and what materials would be needed. So we have had um, books that have cost as little as 140, a basic um, reback that really doesn't need a whole lot, all the way up to probably about $1,500. I have another question about your book restoration. If you get a book that um, was damaged by a family pet or child or something like that, uh, and some pages uh, can't be restored, do you have any processes of creating a facsimile copy from another book and then inserting the pages that um, 
back into the book to make it look practically like the original page? Um, yes and no. So there, there's a couple things you can do with this. If you want to save the original page, there's a washing process that you can do to get some of the stains or colors and things like that. We don't offer that. Um, yes, you could try to replicate the page, but I can assure you, you will never be able, if it's an antique book, to get the identical color. If I tried to make a copy the identical color and the same type of paper, it just, I, I've yet to get it absolutely perfectly matched. Um, and my thought is when we have a book, and we get a lot of children's book where the kids have scribbled in it. I mean, we didn't, we never ever erase that sort of thing. Those are childhood memories. Those are marks from a child that we feel are, unless the person intentionally asks that we remove it and attempt to, we do not never take writing off of it. The, does that help? Yes. Okay. So we've got another question in the chat. What is the most unique book you have worked on? Ooh. Oh gosh, I gotta think for a second. All of them are unique. <laughs> <laughs> um, my favorite is you get, um. It's a home remedies book. I like it personally because of the color illustrations and the moving body parts. It's massive. It looks like, I think it stands well over five inches in thickness. And when you get it, all these like unusual old home remedies, and then it has all these like uh, movable body parts where you could take the muscle layer off, the, the brain, you know, it's just a really cool. And I'm trying to think what else, like- The music box book, that was pretty easy. Oh yeah, we did a, um, a book that had, it was a music box, but then it was, had a velvet cover. And it also had those, it was, um, it's like Davy board, but I don't know the word to explain it to you guys, like a chipboard to insert um, photographs into. So that was something that I repaired, a very unique structure yeah. for a book that presented a, a challenge. Yeah. We just, you know, it's most of the stuff we get is your, it's Bibles. We like 90% of our work is Bibles. Mm -hmm. Do you get very many requests from archivists or museums for projects? Yeah, so we're working with the Catholic Diocese of Wheeling and we're restoring their archives slowly but surely. Um, they give us probably between five to 10 books at a time and work on them for them. At that most, they're the only, um, I believe that's the only, business or organization that we've That's worked with. contacted us so far. Yeah. yeah. We have done some um, like large single sheet prints, paper restoration. Oh yes, for recently. the Masonic, yeah, the, we did it, um, but we also did something for the for Masonic. The, yeah, um, for the Masons. Um, Sorry, we've had so many orders that it takes the uh, most of the, our clientele are just, you know, our people that come in and want something restored. We have a couple that, you know, have, and it's typically an individual within an organization that said, I don't want to see this deteriorate. Um, like they have a ledger or something along those lines. I, we have had um, where, uh, there was fire a firefighter how do i want to say what's the word for it 
I have brain Fire, fireman? Yeah, but anyhow, so they, firemen, I guess, that they had some ledgers that they wanted done, but I think our prices are out of their range. They're looking for something more commercial. And because I specialize in conservation and restoration, I'm very hesitant of doing um, like where people ask me and say, no, you could just do this. Don't worry about this stuff. Don't worry about the rip pages. And I have to remind them, I go, this is a representation of the work I do. So I don't want this being out there, even though you're okay with it, it also is an example of what I do. So we get turned away because of our prices sometimes. So I was wondering, um, what is the most, you know, you talked about some really unique books that you've worked on. What was like the most challenging one or one that, you know, when you got it, you were just like, oh gosh, where do we even start? Like what's, what's the most difficult thing that you've done? They all are. <laughs> the directory, the Parkersburg directory with the chewed pages, we sat, on the floor, like for hours at a time, taking pieces and going, I think that says, oh yeah, I remember that's over here. And then trying to fit it in. Mm -hmm. And then of course the wedding album. You would think of something, <laughs> I, I truly say that, that the wedding album was a nightmare because what I should have done is recreate everything new and I kept the original pages on this sounds so boring but I'm telling you what ended up happening is that because it was mass produced I used the original pages they paid over several thousand dollars this photo album I found online for fifty dollars but the plastic inserts that they had after I used goat skin leather sewed it they just started all falling apart because they were cheaply made and it, it just was so frustrating. I spent what should have only been like three weeks, five months, having to go back and forth between it. And that's what ends up happening is we often get a book until we, we have to break it down to truly know what we're getting into. And I'd have to say the Catholic Diocese books were really tough. The paper are like, they're so acidic when you start to get pages that are clay coated, they're flaky. And um, I'm actually going to be seeing him on Friday and I need to talk to him about some alternatives because even if I do edge repair on these books, they'll flake right off along that edge. It won't hold sewing, it won't hold a repair. And so that's when you need a clamshell box. There's just, it, you can't reverse that damage. So it's when you get into paper that's really acidic, dry. It feels like crackers in your hands that the paper falls apart. And I dread making the phone call to a person and saying, I, unfortunately, your book is not going to hold a repair. And um, we had that. Yeah, we did. That yeah. one, and we tried and tried and tried. And the paper was just so brittle. Every repair you make would just break off right where you made the repair. And it gets to a point where you just have to tell them like, no. And the funny thing was the guy said, I'm not sure why I wanted to fix that book anyways. <laughs> it wasn't a high, it wasn't a high value no, book either. It wasn't. He just decided to fix it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that sometimes the um the people we meet are just as unique as the books that they bring us. We've met a lot of really great people. We, really, we have. There's something really special about our clients. We love our clients. Yes. We build this bond and just getting to hear their story about why their book means so much to them and knowing that the service that we're doing for them, um, it's very rewarding. And um, it, it's fun getting to know them, getting to know. And there's some unique stories about how these they come in possession of these books or the history of the family yeah. so yeah we really enjoy working with our clients looks like there might be another we've got another um... question oh, um, good oh has anybody ever tried to bring in 
a stolen rare book that they wanted fixed up a little bit so that they could sell it for a better price. <laughs> not that I'm aware of. I would hope not. We have, I did have a guy who came in and um, who, he collects books and sells them. That's what he does for a living. But he didn't like what he had to hear from me because he was taking them and making them look brand new. And I said, you're devaluing the book by what you're doing. He goes, yeah, but people want to. I go, but you're, you're ruining the integrity of the book. I go, so I'm ha he wanted me to make them all new and shiny and nice and gold. And I said that, again, it's that idea of that's not what I do. Um, and then if you want something like that, you're looking at a very high cost. So then he was at the so who knows, maybe amongst his collection, he had some stolen or rare books, but no, not that I'm aware of. I'd like to think all our clients are trustworthy. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you would know. If yeah. It was stolen. I don't know if, see, the thing is, I can tell you about structures and working books, but as for like, I am not a book dealer. So like a lot of people want us to appraise their book. And yeah, no I mean, idea. we can suggest sites, we can get online and we can look. My best recommendation is to go on eBay or go on like a books and look where it's, what it's being sold for online. That's all you have to do. What is the competitive rate going on out there? that's identical to your year and volume of the book, the copyright of your book. We have another question in chat. Um, for the restoration classes, do you bring your own book? No, I provide them because I need to make sure that they're in a certain condition. Like I don't, if you bring your own book, I'm afraid like you'll bring it, like how I was talking about paper that's highly acidic. If you brought a book that won't hold a repair, I have tons and tons of old books here. So we we'll just use what we got here. But they could bring one if they wanted. I mean, if it was conducive to the class, right? No? Maybe? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one teaching the class. I would prefer, prefer to provide the book. And maybe on round two, I just like to know what we're working with before we get started. That's how I would like to run the class. Sure. Yeah. But if you have an old book that you would like to look at and talk about and bring along, I don't know if it would be part of the class itself. Yeah. All right, do we have any, any last questions? Nope, doesn't look like it. Um, did you say you had a, a slide with links after this yes. one? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, so this is, I have our website. I have our phone number. Um, so Talus Online, they're based out of New York City. Um, that's where you can find bookbinding equipment and supplies. Uh, website for acid free boxes. You could also find at Talus as well and university products. So, and we have all this information. We have links on our, if you go to our website, you can find a lot of this information there as well. You mentioned the book finding equipment site too. Tell us. Oh, yeah. Never mind. Equipment. I was they thinking. Yeah, I was thinking of another one. Oh, no. All right. Well, thank you so much. This was so interesting. We had a, a comment in the chat about how informative it was. Um, so thank you. I will um, be sending out to everyone uh, the video when it's ready, as well as um, links to their website um, and a survey where hopefully you can, can share how much you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate it. Thank, no, you. thank you. We, re we really enjoyed this. Yeah. Thanks for everybody for showing up and listening to us. 
and asking the questions. Yeah. We appreciate it. And if you have any other additional questions or we do free estimates. So if you have books that you are concerned about and have questions about, um, shoot us an email. We have no problem helping out in any way. So we can help. be happy to answer any questions you have. Awesome. Right. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, everybody yeah, have thanks. a good night. Good night. Bye.